action. Hello, my dear students. I want to briefly cover, for those of you who haven't done it yet, our interpreting graphics assignment. I'd like to assign these from time to time because they're good practice for standardized tests. When you take the ACT science portion or the ACT Aspire science, you will notice from time to time there are similar sorts of questions and uh, problems to interpret that are graphical interpretations of scientific data. So this one's very simple and involves significant figures and measurements. I wanted to incorporate it into the lab because one of the other obligations I have besides preparing you to take standardized tests is to teach you laboratory techniques. And there's two important laboratory <coughs> techniques here. One is measuring volumes using a graduated cylinder and one is measuring temperature. So let's look at our assignment. Our assignment here is interpreting graphics and starts out with pictures of two graduated cylinders. So mm -hmm. come back to me and I have a variety of some volumetric glassware here. I have a beaker, I have an Erlenmeyer flask, and I have three different 10 milliliter graduated cylinders. Here in my kitchen, in the classroom, we have them, we have 25 mil, 50 mil, 100 mil, 250 mil, 500 mil, and 1,000 milliliter graduated cylinders that we use all the time to measure different volumes. But I have three different 10 mil ones, and I have a beaker. If you look at this beaker, you can see this is a 250 milliliter beaker, and it has graduations up to 200 milliliters. 50, 100, 150, 200, with lines in between. So obviously it's 25, 50, 75, 100. If you look at the Erlenmeyer flask, this is a 250 mil Erlenmeyer flask, taller and narrower, and it gives you a little bit better um, estimate, but again, it goes to 225 in 25 mil increments. So not a very accurate way to measure. The graduated cylinders are a more accurate way to measure. Here's one, zero to 10 mils. It's a glass cylinder that has graduations on it, hence the term graduated cylinder. This one has a plastic base and the plastic ring at the top is not to slide up and down and let you see or focus on anything. It's there to make it student proof so that when it falls over, it doesn't break. Um, a lot of people just automatically pop those off because they think they get in the way. But it's saved me a lot of money having these on some of our cylinders. Now, let me say that this one is shorter, goes from 0 to 10 with 5 graduations between each milliliter. I have here a sample of some Grady tap water with some simple food coloring in it. I lost my assignment. Here it comes. And you can read it, but there's one interesting thing when you do this. Here's another glass graduated cylinder. This one's from 0 to 10 milliliters. But between, notice this is taller than that one. Between each number, are 10 graduations. So this is a more accurate graduated cylinder to give me more accurate numbers. Can you close in on this? If you look, however, at this um, water level, the question arises, how do you read it? So if you'll indulge me, I'll give you all the answers to your homework or to your assignment. If you'll let me explain how to read a graduated cylinder. Because water, and if you've been to biology, you know water is a very unique molecule. It 
can do something called hydrogen bonding. So if we have our graduated cylinder with our graduations, every so many numbers like so and I have my liquid in there the liquid adheres to the side and forms a little crescent-shaped structure or a crescent-shaped uh, phenomenon known as a meniscus. From menses, referring to the moon as in menstruation, uh, women's cycle that follow a lunar or moon cycle. It's from the same Latin prefix and it's because it has a little crescent, like a crescent moon here. And the question is, where do you read that? Well, you want to be on a level with it. You don't want to hold it here and read it. You want to hold it at eye level. And we traditionally make sure we read it consistently. And if this is my eyeball right here, I want to read the bottom of it. So this would be 7.2.4, and it's right on the point four, so we can go a third digit, 7.40, for example. So that's how you read that. Now, let's look at the two cylinders in our example, and I'll give you your answers. But we will be practicing and using these sorts of scientific glassware and apparatus for our experiments. In fact, next week or the week after when we can get back to measuring density um, by measuring volume in the lab. So, this first cylinder here doesn't have graduations between the milliliter lines and as such can only be read accurately to one, and then the next one is estimated. You know, if it's a halfway, we might say, you know, 6.5 milliliters. If it's a little more than halfway, 6.6. .6. If it's almost a seven, we might say 6.9. You have significant figures that you can read with certainty and a final figure that is estimated. So this cylinder has two significant figures. One we read with certainty, one that's estimated. The next question asks, cylinder B can be read to how many significant figures? And if you go back up to cylinder B, it's like my good 10 mil graduated cylinder that has 10 graduations with 10 graduations between them. So there are 10 graduations between the milliliters, so I can accurately read it to... 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, but if the meniscus lies between, for example, 1.2 and 1.3, I can estimate a third digit. So I have three significant figures. The next question, and you can see the answer here, says, you know, I asked you to measure out 2.55 milliliters. You would pour a little water in here, and then using a pipette, you would measure you would add dropwise until you got to, down here, 2.5. I can see the 5 right there and go halfway between the two. So you would use cylinder B for that. And if someone just said, I need 3 mils, not 3.0, not 3.00, but 3 mils, you know, a dosage you might put in somebody's ear or something, you know, a 3 mil dose of eardrops or something that's not critical <coughs> out to two or three significant figures, then you could use any cylinder, either A or B. Okay, I think they might have wanted A. So let's talk about temperature real fast and measurements with temperature. This 
assignment shows a picture of a thermometer. I have some thermometers here. I just want to talk to you about temperature measurement. This is a Galileo thermometer. And if you look, it has different spheres with different densities, different colored liquids to make it easier to tell them apart. And on them is written 80 degrees, 76 degrees, and 72 degrees. All I know is that my temperature inside my kitchen right now is between 72 and 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we don't use Fahrenheit in chemistry or in science. We'll use degrees Celsius, but it's what's commonly used in the United States. You may have seen people taking temperatures with this. I've been taking my children's temperatures, you know, three and four times a day because we're quarantining with this. And a lot of people think the laser is what's measuring the temperature. And the laser could experience a frequency or a wavelength shift because you can't shift one without the other. And there could be some very sophisticated um, circuitry to detect those frequency shifts with respect to temperature and maybe related to temperature, but that's not at all how it works. There's actually a small infrared sensor that is aimed at the same point as the laser. So the laser is really just for aiming. What's doing the temperature measuring is an infrared sensor, um, very sensitive infrared sensitive sensor that is um, just read directly um, from in this instrument. But let's talk about thermometers. I have a couple of thermometers here. We have mercury thermometers. I don't like to use them. A lot of people have never read a thermometer anymore. I have one here that's graduated in degrees Fahrenheit and degrees Celsius. And it says right now that the temperature in here is, oops, I am holding it. It says it's 80 degrees. It's not 80 degrees um, Fahrenheit in here. Um, I was holding the bulb. The way these thermometers work is there's a liquid in there. And as we'll learn when we start talking about density in the next section, when something warms up, it expands with one notable exception. When something cools down, it contracts or condenses. Contracts would be probably a better word. And so what we have is a bulb filled with a liquid. In this case, it's alcohol with food coloring in it. And as it expands to a very, very tiny, narrow capillary, small temperature changes give you a big change of movement. And the glass is constructed to kind of magnify that capillary so that you can easily read it. Um, here's another one. This one is one we're going to use. It's in Celsius only. It has a little bumper on it. That's so that they do not roll because they're expensive. And um, this one has a Fahrenheit, not, not a Fahrenheit, I'm sorry, a Celsius scale between 0 and 100, where 0 is a freezing point of water, 100 is the boiling point of water, and there are 100 equal divisions between those two points, a very logical system. The problem is, is that when you deal with very cold temperatures, um, you get large negative numbers. So we will also be dealing with the official SI unit of temperature called the Kelvin, not the degree Kelvin. We say degrees Celsius, but we just call them Kelvins. And this thermometer on our assignment has a scale at the top, 17, 18, 19, 20. And 20 is cool room temperature. 25 degrees is about 75 degrees. So that would be, you know, very cool room temperature, like 65 or 67 or so. Um, I have to do the math to do the conversion perfectly. The other one says, instead of 17, 18, 19, 20, it says 290, 291, 292, 293. The Kelvin scale has 
magnitude equal to the Celsius scale, but begins at a point called absolute zero, where all molecular motion stops. That particular temperature we mark as zero Kelvin, named after Lord Kelvin, who did a lot of this kind of research. That scale is, like I say, those units are equal in magnitude, but the scale starts at a different point. And it's at minus 273.15, but we'll just, for our purposes today, say minus 273 Celsius is equal to zero Kelvin. So to do the conversion, if you want to do it, you just add 273 to the um, Kelvin scale to get the Celsius, and if you want Celsius going the other way, you subtract 273. This reads directly, and it reads a little more than 20 degrees and a little more than 293. See, I added 273 to 20 and got 293. So, if I may, I will give you some answers here. So, on this, what temperature scale is shown at the top? Because I know that these two scales differ from one another by 273 degrees, I know I'm dealing with the Celsius and the Kelvin scale. The Fahrenheit scale would go, instead of from 0 to 100, from 32 degrees at 0 for freezing to 212 degrees for 100 degrees at boiling. We're not going to use that Fahrenheit scale. We're going to stick with our metric SI units. So, when it says which temperature scale is shown at the bottom, because my numbers are 290, 291, 293, that must be the Kelvin scale. Room temperature Kelvin we typically call 298. Okay? Uh, that's approximately 75, a little bit more degrees. Um, so, the next question says, a student reported the temperature to be 20 degrees. If you look at this, it is at 20, but I can see it went a little bit past it. You know, here's 20, here's 21. That must have been 20.1, 20 20.2, I'll let you call it. And again, there is a meniscus. The interesting thing about the meniscus in a thermometer it's pointed the other direction, you know? It's a pillow top up, or crescent moon up. But, that being said, um, this meniscus and this reading, the meniscus is minimal, so we just read to the level of the liquid. You know, that's why they put the red dye into these, so that they can be more easily seen. It takes a little bit of skill and a little experience reading them. I'll leave these out in the classroom for the face-to-face -face students. So, you know, is this the correct number of significant figures? No, you can read the measurements as given and you can estimate one more. So he should have said 20.1 or 20.2. So here's what I put. Um, a student reported the temperature to be 20 degrees, is this correct? Is this the correct number of significant figures? And why? No, it's not the significant. 20 degrees C can be read directly, and significant figures include a final digit that is estimated. And for our last question, and to close out this assignment and your work for today, Tuesday, it asks, in what physical state does water exist at the temperature so shown? And there's no information for you to know that, except that you should know and remember from our discussion of the temperature scales that the Celsius scale goes from 0 to 100. Our temperature was a little above 20. The 0 is freezing, or it's the freezing point or the melting point, depending on which direction you approach it at. But above zero, water is liquid until you get to 100 degrees. And when you're above 100 degrees, the water is a vapor or 
in the gaseous form. We tend to call it a vapor um, because at room temperature it's normally a liquid. And unless you keep it under pressure to force it to stay a liquid, anything of any water above 100 degrees is going to be exist as a vapor. So we're between the boiling point and the freezing point or melting point. So that water would be in the liquid state. That's your assignment. That's an introduction to temperature and measuring volume. And that's your answer. So everybody gets 100 on this. Um, you're going to need it when we get to the test because I can make these questions harder. But um, not for the point of making them harder, but to make for the point of making them more sophisticated and us more and more advanced as we progress through our study of chemistry. Stay safe, and I'll see you in the next video.